Uh, <coughs> okay. Um, the title of my talk, I'm sure everyone recognizes, is from Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. And it's actually a line that's said by Cleopatra at the point where she knows that Octavius, the Roman, uh, uh, Roman chief, is basically lying to her. And she uses this great phrase, he words me girls. Um, and this is actually from their, the photograph is from their recent National Theatre uh, in the UK production. Um, and what I want to talk about today is the widespread myth, as I hope I'm going to show you, that Shakespeare makes up lots of words. How many people have, been, have heard or been told that story, that Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's great because he makes up lots of words? <laughs> and I'm, a, I'm sorry to, to rain on your prairie, but it's untrue. He does not. And, and I could stop now. And, <laughs> Um, but let's let's move on. So, so these are the results. These are the results of a, um, a YouTube search that just I just put in Shakespeare invented words or words Shakespeare invented, and you see we get first four hits are all uh, people on YouTube telling us about all of the words that Shakespeare invented, um, and you can see that second one. The vid, this video shows us that Shakespeare invented over two thousand new words and phrases like eyeball and anchovy. Shakespeare invented anchovies. Uh, the next one, Shakespeare was a man of many words. He wrote nearly 40 plays, which is kind of true. Uh, but 17 words Shakespeare invented. 2017. Next one, words you didn't know were invented by Shakespeare. Well, maybe you didn't know because actually they weren't invented by Shakespeare. <laughs> Turns out that William Shakespeare can be credited for the invention of thousands of words. So. Where does all this come from? Why, why do people think that Shakespeare invented words? Well, we can blame one person, and this person is. Sir James Murray, the uh, first editor of the Oxford English Dictionary. And here you can see him in his scriptorium. And he surrounded, this was actually a shed that was built in his garden in Oxford. And you can see he's surrounded by a lot of cubby holes, and those cubby holes are full of slips of paper. And they're the slips that were used to write the Oxford English Dictionary, which is, in case any of you have actually seen one, it's, it used to be 22 volumes. And then the second edition, they squeezed it down a bit with smaller print to 20 volumes. And now they don't even put it out on paper anymore. It's just online. But it's an attempt to record pretty much every word in English, an amazing piece of Victorian scholarship. But it was actually constructed by James Murray and his assistants writing to people all over the world, and mainly in the Anglophone world, and asking them to read books, note down interesting uses of words, and send them in. And they collated all of these slips together. If we go on to the next, if you press on, we should. Here's a box with those slips, and you can see they're tied together with string. It's a very it's a kind of testament to Victorian industry and scholarship. And on the left-hand side, you can actually see, this is one of the letters that Murray used to send out to the readers, uh, phrased in fantastic Victorian English. Just press it on again. There's a kind of blow up of the letter. Um, and what he's doing is he's saying, well, the list is actually, here's a bunch of words we've got some interesting things for, but we want more examples of these words. So this is, he's kind of crowdsourcing the dictionary. And there were, there were literally hundreds of people all around the world reading books and sending these slips in. So actually, I mean, they, and the, the Oxford English Dictionary is really a fantastic piece of scholarship. Um, and for its day, represented the kind of cutting edge of big data. But as you can see, it's very much analog data collection. Um, <coughs> Now, how come this leads to people thinking that oh, Shakespeare invented lots of words? Well, let's look at one of the words, and that's a very appropriate day, a word for today. Um, the word gloomy. Now, if you go on any of these websites, pretty much every single one of them will say Shakespeare invented the word gloomy. It's a very popular word for Shakespeare to have invented. So let's have a look at the OED entry for it. 
So this is what a typical entry in the Oxford English Dictionary looks like for pretty much every, any word. At the top, you have gloomy, adjective, you get pronunciation, you can actually click on them and hear it, depending on whether you're British or US, you can have either one. <laughs> uh, you get a frequency gauge, and you get etymology, tells you what language it comes from or how it's been put together. And then you get, and this is the, this is the typical, this is the thing that marks out the Oxford English Dictionary. It's also the thing that causes all of our problems. You get a list of uses of the word through history. And if you, we'll, we'll zoom in and blow up the first one. You can see the first entry for Gloomy is 1594, Shakespeare, Titus Andronicus. So people looked at these lists of words and thought, ah, oh, the first person mentioned here is Shakespeare. Shakespeare invented this word. Unfortunately, that was a misreading of what the Oxford English Dictionary was trying to do. The first citation is not supposed to be the first use of the word in English. It's just supposed to be the earliest interesting use of the word, or the earliest use by an important writer or the earliest use by Shakespeare, because important writer tends to transfer directly into Shakespeare. Remember, these were just people kind of sitting around, a lot of them in Australia, in you know, South Africa. They didn't have a whole research library to go through. Shakespeare's texts are very easily available, so they tended to get read really, really carefully, whereas other writers kind of ignored. Let's go on. Nowadays, however, we don't need to write to 200 people all around the world. Actually, one of the readers for the OED was actually a convicted serial killer uh, imprisoned in Broadmoor Prison uh, in Britain, the, the prison for criminally insane. But you know, serial killers are quite methodical people, so it's quite, a good, <laughs> quite a good person to construct a dictionary. But today what we have rather than a bunch of amateur readers all around the world, it's something called EBO TCP, which stands for Early English Books Online Text Creation Partnership. And what this is, is an attempt to digitize all of the books printed in English that are still existing during Shakespeare's lifetime, actually from about 1450 to 1700. Now, we might think really big data. Actually, this collection has 60,000 books in it which is, and one billion words. That sounds quite good, one billion words. But actually, for today's collection, that's not very much. But it does constitute a huge proportion of the surviving print in English from this period. And it allows us to do things like this. <coughs> Here's a graph showing the entry of the word gloomy into English. So the, the, the kind of horizontal axis is time, so we start over there at 1450, and uh, we come to 1700 at uh, this end. And you can see there's a flat, the, the, the line is flat until we get to about 15, actually 1566. Uh, so the word gloomy did not exist, well, as far as we know, did not exist before that time. The weather was always great, it was never dark, there was no need, there's no need for people to talk about gloomy stuff. 1566, the weather started to get bad, like today, people suddenly said, oh no, we have to have a word for this. Where's Shakespeare when you need it? Uh, and people start to use the word gloomy then, and you can see by the end of, by 1700, it's got quite popular. Uh, who are these, who are the people who are using this word? Let's. Uh, go on to the next slide. Okay, this you won't be able to read any of this, but you're not supposed to. You're just supposed to get a sense of these are all the instances of gloomy in Ebo TCP before Shakespeare's use of it in 1594. <coughs> so you can see, and you can see that gloomy is picked out in yellow. There's quite a lot. There's about 30 something. So, did the OED readers miss? all of these instances. Is that why Shakespeare is the first instance? Well, let's have a look at some of these instances. Let's go to the next. These are the first two, by the way, just to underline the fact. And you see they're both from 1566. And if you know your dates of Shakespeare, Shakespeare was two years old mm -hmm. in 1566. Mm -hmm. So unless he was very, very precocious, mm -hmm. he did not invent the word gloomy. Um, let's have a look at some of the other instances. Next one. Uh, 1568, 
The word gloomy appears in a very obscure text that you wouldn't expect the OED readers to have come across, the Holy Bible. <laughs> Next. Uh, 1581, it appears in Seneca. Now, you might, not have, you might not know anything about Seneca. Seneca was the playwright that people read in the English Renaissance, possibly the most influential playwright in terms of actually Shakespeare and other tragedy writers at the time. So this is a really, really important text. So again, there is no way that people looking for words in the, in the OED did not read this text, absolutely central to early modern uh, culture. And next one, uh, 1590, as you can see, the word gloomy appears five times in Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, and one of the absolute kind of pillars of English Renaissance culture. So again, a text that the OED people certainly read because there's lots of other words for it in the dictionary. So one of the things we know, we can assume from this is there is no way that the people producing the OED did not know about these earlier instances of gloomy. They just chose not to put them in because they weren't interested in pinning down the absolute earliest reference to gloomy. English professors and everyone else since have just ignored that and assumed that if Shakespeare comes first, he's the one who invented the word. OK, let's go on. Let's go on to another word. There's another really, really popular word on the Shakespeare lying sites. <laughs> <coughs> Swagger. Now, swagger is kind of an interesting one because it behaves slightly differently in terms of how it comes into the language. Let's go to the next. Right. Here's the OED uh, entry for swagger. And if we blow up, you'll see again, first instance of swagger is Shakespeare, in this case, Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, probably misdated, if you know the date of Midsummer Night's Dream, but you know, let's not worry about that too much. <laughs> because actually, within this entry, there's also something else. Note that this says 1600. So this is the first citation, 1600. But if we blow up another bit, which is this bit that appears on the etymology section, if we blow up, blow up that, it actually cites an earlier text by Chapman, uh, his translation of Homer's Achilles' shield. Uh, and Chapman not only uses the word swagger in this book, he actually writes a preface about the fact that he's used this word mm -hmm. because it's a new, unusual word, and he talks about where it comes from. So it's not like Shakespeare, not like the OED people didn't know that there was an earlier text, and an earlier text that actually acknowledges that this is a new word. So again, they're not kind of they're not trying to get the earliest use. Well, let's have a look at that graph for swagger, because swagger is even more kind of interesting graph than uh, for gloomy. Again, you can see the flat, the flat line. Nobody swaggered. I mean, and this is actually true. Nobody swaggered <laughs> until the 1590s. <laughs> and you can see there's a flat line. And then it suddenly becomes really popular, especially for about 10, 20 years. There's a real fad for this word. And it becomes really, really common in English, then drops off a bit. Um, and if we look at the kind of people who were using swagger, let's go on. So here's the, here's the list of swagger and its, its earliest uses. And I, if we go on to the next slide. So these are the, these are the names of the people who are early users of the word swagger. And one of the interesting things about them, to me anyway, is there that you have almost every single significant early modern playwright in that list. So, you, so you can just see um, Florio, who wasn't a playwright, but he hung out with playwrights and Shakespeare uses. He was actually, Florio was actually of Italian parents living in London, and he writes a series of uh, English Italian dictionaries and commentaries on Italian. And so he's a kind of my a source for unusual words. So you can see Florio likes it a lot. He uses it several times. Then you've got Thomas Nash, Middleton, Decker, uh, Samuel Ronans, Shakespeare, and Ben Johnson all using swagger within about 10 years of each other. Now, one of the thing, one of the things I think this illustrates is that it's, it's actually fundamentally misguided. It's choosing my words carefully. It's misguided to look for people who invent words. Because people do not invent words. Linguistic systems 
invent words or allow words to be created. You can only invent the word swagger if your linguistic system allows you to put two elements together, swag and er, and er is a person who does the swag bit. So you could say that actually nobody invented this word. The linguistic system created it by having the potential to allow it to, to exist. And we, who of these might have used it first? We can't know. It might be someone, someone whose work hasn't survived. So the search for an individual who invents any word is kind of a crazy one, a misguided one. Let's go on. Why should you be interested in this? I mean, who could, but frankly, who cares if a bunch of English professors can't read a dictionary? <laughs> is, it, is it really significant or important? And I think that's a, you know, and should we be building databases and kind of searching them to try and find out, chase down words like this? I mean, I kind of like doing it, but, you know, really, should I be, should I be employed at a university to do this kind of stuff? I think we should. <laughs> I think I should. Uh, for a couple of reasons. For one thing, Shakespeare is our most important writer. Pretty much everyone agrees with that. I wouldn't argue with it. And I think we should want to know what it is that makes him so good. Can we explain why Shakespeare is so good? And one of the things people have tried to use to explain why Shakespeare is so good is the fact that he invents words. This is often cited as a kind of objective metric for why Shakespeare is a good writer. He's a good writer because he invents lots of words. So I think it's kind of important to realize, no, that's not true. We can't make that claim about Shakespeare. We can't use that as evidence for why we think he's good. And kind of interestingly, I do a lot of counting of Shakespeare, and so do lots of other people, and nobody has found any, anything you can count in Shakespeare that pulls him out from the average of his time. So every time you plot Shakespeare against all the other people who are writing at the time, he's bang in the middle in the boring average slot. So, and yet, everyone agrees that he's much better than everyone else. So there's something that he's doing that we're not counting yet. So one of the arguments for doing this kind of stuff is to say this is not what makes Shakespeare great. But there's a bigger question, I think, behind this, which I'm, I'm going to end with, which is one of the things we're getting at here in a kind of larger sense is the notion of what constitutes creativity. And Shakespeare's creativity is not the invention of new words any more than Miles Davis' creativity, arguably the most creative musician of the 20th century. Any, you know, nobody writes essays saying, Miles Davis, fantastic musician, because he made new notes. <laughs> and, but the, and, and that, thinking about that kind of paradox should point you towards what maybe what is Shakespeare's creativity and what is creativity more generally tends to be the recombination of elements that already exist or the placement of them in new contexts. And particularly, and also, doing it in collaboration. Jazz is collaborative. Linguistic creativity is always collaborative. You can invent all the words you want, but unless other people start to use them, they don't work. And I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you.